Hello and welcome. So it's been a few days here and I've got the next contender on my table. This is the 2023 Alienware M18 R1. As you can see, it barely fits on my frame here. Let's take a look here and I'll give you my first impressions of the build quality on this 18 inch Alienware for 2023, the M18 R1. And this one stars the RTX 4080. We'll be talking a lot about that later in this review. But first things first, let's take a look around the device and then we'll jump right into some of the other aspects before we dig into the juicy stuff here, which is the gaming performance of this device. I know that's what you're all waiting for, but please be patient and I promise this will be worth the wait. So looking at the top of the device here, we've got a plastic lid. It's a little bit, you know, hollow, but if I open it up here, it has a little bit of flex, nothing too extraordinary that you'd be worried about. It holds its position well at various angles. There is a little bit of wobble, but it stabilizes pretty quickly. Uh, no complaints there. Looking around the rest of the device, if we look at the right hand side of the device here, we've got a flip down Ethernet port. This is a 2.5 gigabit killer Ethernet, and we've got two USB A ports followed by a combination microphone headphone jack. On the right hand side, we're greeted by a single USB type C port. This one is not Thunderbolt 4. And then the back of this device, which is the most well appointed here with all of the ports. So if we look at this here, we'll start on the right hand side with this is the barrel power plug adapter, 330 watts. We'll take a look at the rig in just a moment. This is a full sized SD card reader. This is a mini display port output. This is an HDMI 2.1 another USB type A port, and we've got our Thunderbolt 4 port, and then yet another Thunderbolt 4 ports. So ports wise, this thing is decked out. You should not have any issues with input output whatsoever. IO is well appointed. Thank you very much for that Dell. And if we flip this, this device over, we look at the bottom of the device. We can see here the big ring, the Tron style ring, if you want to call it that. So Alienware's new for 2023 feet or footing, I guess you would call it. For this device here, it is quite solid, it's comfortable, it's in between a hard plastic and a semi-soft touch rubber. It's something akin to what you would see in automobile vehicles and maybe dashboard parts or other components around that have a firm yet soft textured plastic kind of feeling. I've had this device on my lap for multiple hours at a time no issue they sit very well they don't dig into the leg i didn't find any discomfort for using from using this device on my lap there's a lot of venting here and as you can imagine because there's significantly more powerful components in that in this device and the ones i've looked at we're talking a full 175 watts on this rtx 4080 so it does get quite hot and having this on your lap even sometimes in just productivity scenarios will get really really warm to the point where you start to feel some discomfort and you'll have to remove the device from your uh, from your person. What also happens because this lip is actually quite shallow and when you have clothing underneath it, it kind of blocks some of the airflow causing further suction. Uh, and because of that, in, you know, less airflow is introduced into the device, causing this area to heat up significantly more. You can feel it right in the center area, but it also kind of spreads off to the sides as you use this device for extended periods of time. On the top of this device, very typical for Dell here, we've got our light up Alienware logo. And on here, we've got embossed kind of 18 showing that this is the 18 inch model uh, we've got this flange in the back here so when you open the hinge the screen kind of lays back and if we were to open the screen all the way let's see how far this thing can lean back and if we open it there you can see that it's it's a pretty good angle it's nothing out of the extraordinary but i would say maybe so this is how far the device can lay back okay and now if we look at the star, the other star of this show here. So one nice thing to put one nice thing that I do want to point out here is that we've got a two megapixel webcam from Dell. Thank you very much for finally updating the potato cams. I love that all of the manufacturers are doing that, realizing that lots and lots of people are continuously now working from home. So to have better equipment for teleconferencing is fantastic. It also has Windows IR support for a Windows Hello login. Uh, I've tested it, works fantastic, scans your face right away and it logs you in. So now let's take a look at the keyboard. Speaking of the keyboard, I kind of have mixed feelings about this Dell device. I usually like the tactility of the Dell keyboards. However, there's a few particular things to be said about this keyboard. So let me just zoom in a little bit and we'll talk here about what I like and dislike about this particular setup. So first and foremost, I spent the extra 50 Canadian dollars to upgrade to 
Segway Cherry MX Ultra Low Profile Mechanical Switches. And if I can here, I'll show you just a quick sample from the keyboard sound when you're typing using these Cherry MX Ultra Low Profile keys. Let's have a listen. So if we look at it that way, it sounds pretty good. Uh, the feel is definitely fantastic. There's no sponginess here whatsoever. The typing experience is sharp. It's tactile. The keys feel fantastic. The pitch has been reduced a little. I do like the fact that Dell gave us a full size keyboard here. This is a professional device that's going to be a desktop replacement for many people. So having a number pad on the side here, I sometimes use some of these home and end buttons for navigating my page, but also just for doing some number crunching and spreadsheets. It's very, very handy for that. As you can imagine, I'm generating lots of charts for these benchmarks. So to have just a quick ability to look at something and punch in these numbers is fantastic. Thank you for that, Dell. And more importantly, so thank you for not squishing these keys and giving us almost useless, you know, kitten size keys. These are right size keys. However, overall, they've reduced the keys a little bit, compressed the keyboard. And as a result, you end up with these arrow keys in the middle. I don't like that as much. I wish these keys were out here separated or just a little bit indented, indented separately so I could just reach in, grab them and go. That said, I've been able to type very quickly on this thing. I'll try to put up here a benchmark of my typing. Uh, with using the typingcat.com again to do a typing test. I made a lot of mistakes there, but as you can see, I was trying to really hit my stride here and see how fast I can really go with this keyboard. If I type at a more comfortable speed, I could probably get more accuracy and not have any issues. But this keyboard, I have zero complaints. I wish I could have this keyboard just be this much centered with the media keys either off to the side or up here like Asus ROG does it. I really enjoy the fact that media keys are kept separate up here rather than on the left or the right side because they seem to kind of mesh into the keyboard. And of course, this Cherry MX keyboard comes with a full per key RGB lighting setup. You can configure through the Alienware command center software. You can also press F7 here to control the lighting. So there's three levels. It's either off, low, high and then off yet again. So there's three levels to get to control the brightness on the keyboard backlight. Over on the right hand side here, what Dell has done is they've given us some of the programmer keys, home, end, and delete. So there's a little bit of muscle memory training that has to be done to not reach here or use FN slash home combinations, but rather learn to reach up here and use the use to be able to use the actual home key, which works pretty much as intended if you were to have a dedicated home key on a TKL or a full size keyboard. Additionally, Dell has given us some media control here so your volume microphone mute and your speakers mute are up here it works well again a little bit of a couple days of memory and muscle training to know that oh i've got to reach up here for my media controls up here for some of these other programmatic controls for navigating through text uh, and then arrow keys here just by feel so i've kind of learned you know if i'm over here typing and i'm doing something on the trackpad i've kind of learned to really you know reach up find this enter and space key shift key reach down and kind of feel my way to the arrow keys. I do make a mistake occasionally. Other than that, the trackpad itself is pretty good. It is a reasonable size and I like the way that Dell has spaced it. Uh, you know, it's sitting basically there's a half inch to maybe three quarters of an inch underneath the space bar and then it sits with about a half inch lip at the bottom so if you're resting your hand on the device like this with your wrist you're not going to be causing some accidental touches it's smooth it's a good texture similar to what the razor had maybe a little bit less uh, rough or excuse me smooth so it's a little bit rougher which means you can feel as you glide your fingers along and doing navigation gestures you get a good uh, feedback there uh, pressing wise It feels fine, maybe a little mushy if you want to call it that. It's got a nice sharp click to it. Uh, I didn't find it to have any rattle or any wobbliness that would indicate that the device is loose. It's a little bit more taut at the top, but otherwise it's a pretty good key trackpad here. I don't believe this is a Windows Precision trackpad. When I look in my system um, with my device manager, I don't see Windows Precision drivers for this device. I'll try to verify that and add a note on the video if it indeed is a Windows Precision trackpad. Uh, other than that, we've got some venting up here and a keyboard. This is a power on switch slash a uh, power indicator light. It also indicates if your device is in sleep mode uh, or if it's uh, you know doing some other function. So this is kind of a helpful display, but I really do wish that in 2023, manufacturers stop cheaping out on us and really give us all of the biometrics we need to secure our devices. It is a shame that they could not have thrown in here a $10 fingerprint reader.
in combination with the Windows Hello IR camera. One other thing to say here about this Alienware M18R1 is that it does pick up fingerprints and quite a bit of dust. This texture here on the keyboard's deck uh, and the device's deck is actually a kind of a soft touch rubber feel and I'm not sure if the camera can catch it here but there's a little bit of an oil stain. I guess I must have been eating something. If you look at this here, so I wanted to leave this here just to show you guys that it's it does start to look like after a while maybe this surface will start to discolor. Uh, we'll grab a microfiber cloth here and if you just kind of go in a sweet round motion it's very easy to wipe off any dust or grime that does build up on this device, but that means you got to keep one of these handy with you at all times in order to keep this looking presentable. Uh, it does catch quite a bit of dust. Maybe you can see up here around the venting because that's where all of the airflow suction is created for intake into this device. So it does get very dusty overall, but grab your microfiber cloth, give it a nice quick wipe, and you've got a fairly clean device yet again to enjoy. Additionally, when you open the device, you can open it one handed. So you have to kind of dig in here with your nail or your finger. And as you start to lift up, you can see it kind of slides around the desk a little bit. Those feet are not the grippiest because they're kind of a tougher plastic. So it does slide around the desk a bit. It's very easy to do that, which means you end up smudging your thumb all over the Windows IR and Hello camera. That's the webcam on this device. But when you do get it open, the, the logo starts to light up on the back here. Of course, this is all controllable from the Alienware command center as well. But then I usually end up holding it down with my other hand on the deck and then lifting it up like so. So I can open it. You know, there's a little bit of a screen wobble here, depending on the position. If it's lower, it's a lot more wobbly. But once you bring it up here, there is no creak, no squeak. This is a very solid hinge. Wherever I leave it, that is the position in which this screen will stay. So I'm very happy with the overall hinge and the build quality here. Let's talk about the weight for a moment. And that's not so good part about this device. If you look at the official specifications, Dell mentions 8.90 pounds on this device for 2023. And you feel it. This device is built dense. There is a tremendous amount of material inside this device. First of all, why Dell? When most of the other manufacturers are able to get away with 18 inch laptops in the seven pound range, why do you need two pounds extra? Are you giving us any more performance? Probably not, but I have yet to test any other 4080 or 4090 laptops to really see if that less weight, you know, has thermal issues or, you know, performance issues because they cannot hit the 175 watts because of thermal constraints, power constraints, what have you. But looking at this device here, nine pounds, I'll say one thing about nine pounds. It is not, I mean, by any means, not one handable. Unless you have really big hands, you're a strong fella, you can maybe switch this around. You know, I'm used to being able to carry most of my laptops from just the corner like this with one hand. This, I feel like it's going to snap my thumb. And even if I was to grab it here from the center, like so, and grab the device, it, it feels like I'm putting a lot of strain on my wrist. It's not balanced. It's very, very heavy weight wise in the back. And I just feel like it's going to drop from my hand anyway, any at any point and be shattered into multiple pieces. So I'm not very happy with the weight at all. This is probably the heaviest device that I have used or tested or played with in the last few years. And to add insult to injury, Dell has given us this. This is a weapon of mass destruction. If you look at this, this is first of all, because this is a 40 equipped, 4080 equipped laptop, we have a 330 watt power adapter here. This thing is absolutely massive. And I'm sure you've seen these. I know that Dell is offering on their X16, I believe, a 330 watt slim GAN adapter. I have yet to see what that actually looks like, but Dell, please give us an option to buy that separately or to select that instead of this brick when we're buying this M18 R1. It's 2023, please give us options. One positive thing I, I will say about the Dell 330 watt power adapter though, is that the ATX cord that plugs into the wall is longer than what I've seen with the Blade 18 and also with the Strix G18. So thank you for that. And the overall cable length this one gives you is about three meters from the wall to your laptop. So that's very, very handy. The cable itself, however, is quite thick and heavy, so it doesn't mold very easily, which means trying to you know, string it around your table or around your bedside is going to be a little bit challenging. And talking about the SSD in this device, I have a couple of things to say. First and foremost, for the price that I paid for this device at $4,300 Canadian, Dell, please stop cheaping out on us at giving us only a 512 gig SSD to start on a dedicated gaming machine that will be a desktop replacement. Minimum, absolutely one terabyte, please. That said, it is a Gen 4 drive, and if you look at the 
benchmarks here it is from Kioxia, so it's maybe a lesser known brand uh, and the 500 gig drive the performance is kind of hit or miss the read performance is decent the theoretical limit being 7000 megabytes per second read and write on gen 4 speeds if you look at this device here it's kind of approaching that on the read but the write speed is nearly half so it's quite low on the read speed uh, the other numbers are just fine my biggest gripe is that in order to really make this device useful you need to get additional drive the one other plus about this machine and the ssds and storage situation is that dell has given us four yes four ssd slots now mind you two of those slots are actually the 2230 so this Kioxia drive at 500 gigs that is pre-installed in the device at the very very base model for storage configuration is also a 23 22 30 millimeter ssd drive so with the four slots you can potentially go up to i believe you know four terabytes each perhaps in the 2280 millimeter slots and then there's two 2230, one of which is populated by this 512 gig Kyoxia drive. I looked at the cost of maybe an additional drive like this if I wanted to run Windows and Linux as a parallel dual boot situation. The, this specific drive is available for on Amazon for about just shy of $200 Canadian. So that would be uh, my preferred way to do it. And then using the two drives that are 2280 for storage, perhaps one as a game drive and one as a work slash production drive for the video editing work that I do. I really believe you could easily get a Western Digital SN850 or SN850X. Uh, one or two terabyte editions for about the same price as this 500 gig 2230 millimeter drive is on Amazon or other retailers online and that will give you much much better performance and overall uh, longer write times and write capacity and it'll be a lot lot more performant I would prefer to do that rather than go with these devices so I'm glad I didn't pay Dell the extra dollars they charge through the nose by the way for some of the higher configurations and that if I need storage and I decide to keep this device I will actually actually go and buy my own storage and add it to this device to configure it as I prefer. Being that this device is a laptop, battery life is also import important. Now, if we look at the specifications for this device, and I've, I'm showing here by if you go to the Dell.com website, go to their support page, uh, search for and find your Alienware M18R1 de device. And if you navigate down here, you can go to the manuals and documents section. If you click this, you'll be brought to this setup and specifications as well as a service manual. Click on the view page or you can download the PDF alternatively for the specifications for this device. And if you go here to the specifications section, scroll down until you get to battery. If you click on that, you'll notice a couple of key important factors here. One, that is a lithium ion 6 cell 97 watt hour battery. Weighs nearly a pound, so it does add quite a bit of heft to this device. But what's I think more important here and what's more interesting to us is that these standard charging times and the different modes that are provided for this battery. Now, in order for you to use these, you need to download the Dell Power Manager. Uh, and if you click here, you can go to support, search for that application and download it. Uh, it's a little bit sketchy though, because the last update to that application was 2021. I don't know if that is accurate, whether it's relevant, and it does seem to work. It allows me to select some of these various modes to control whether I want the battery to be uh, preserved if I'm using it with AC power plugged in most of the time or if I'm using these different charging modes. Now the charging speed itself varies based on what mode you select so standard charging we'll just put it in a typical uh, use cycle so you get the maximum cycles out of this device which is three hours. If you use express charge it reduces the hours slightly the overall battery life is uh, shortened but you get faster charges time two hours it says when the computer is turned off. Keep in mind that if you have the computer on and you're using it while you're charging it's it's actually quite slow to charge it's uh, but you can also enable the express charge boost which again it only works if you have the computer off it gets you to about 30 percent 30 to 35 percent in uh, 20 minutes it says here i saw it a little bit longer than that about 22 minutes but nonetheless you have that option if you so choose uh, the 97 watt hour battery will take a while to fill up even if you have the express charge boost option because it'll charge quickly and then it'll slow down and kind of trickle charge until it hits that 100% fully charged mark. In terms of battery life using the actual device, what I saw was about three hours in my typical developer workflow. The same testing process that I've used for the Rogue Strix G18 and for the Razer Blade 18 for 2023. And that is to have my developer workflow with all of my applications, multiple browsers, Docker containers, Slack, messaging, email open, and just working as if I'm a typical uh, developer throughout my day. So taking it off in the morning uh, at around 9 a.m., 
full full 100 charge and just using the device until it's one or two percent battery life left and the computer is complaining for me to plug it in otherwise i'll lose my work so this is consistent with what i saw from the razor blade 18 that was also giving me about three hours of battery life with a with the exact same workflow uh, on the rog strix g18 i'm not sure what kind of black magic voodoo that they've done to that thing but i was getting nearly a full hour more sometimes even more than that so the, the testing process also includes setting the brightness of the display down to 30%, setting battery saver mode to on in the Windows uh, battery, battery settings. Uh, the, the performance plan is set to balance. And in terms of the Alienware control center software, I've also selected the battery mode there to prolong the battery life. So with those four settings checked and you know checked off before I do these battery tests and assessments, I'm getting about three hours of battery life on this device. Disappointing, sure, for 2023, but given the size of this device and the components that are in it, I'm not entirely surprised considering that CPU can boost well above 100 watts, that Intel i9-13900H. If you use the battery less, for example, if you're just surfing or if you're watching a movie, anything that's optimized, you'll get a lot longer battery life or battery estimate. Okay, and let's quickly talk about the exact specs that I'm running in this device. What is the configuration that I've ordered from Dell? Let's hop in here and have a look. So if you look at the M18, there's a couple of different options here. The base model offers a 13700HX, but as soon as you select a 4080, it triggers some other changes on this page. So I'm running an i9-13900HX, which is again a 24 core and 32, 32 thread CPU with 5.4 gigahertz turbo. The 13950HX was 5.5 gigahertz turbo and the 13980HX was 5.6 gigahertz uh, max turbo. I opted for 32 gigabytes of DDR5 DRAM here. It is in dual channel mode. It's running two by 16 gigabyte DDR5 modules. However, one gripe I have about the RAM is that this is 4800 megahertz RAM instead of the 5600 megahertz speed RAM that the Razer Blade 18 is offering. The Rogue Strix G18 for 2023 is also running slower RAM at 4800 megahertz. I don't know if these devices will get a BIOS update that will allow us to add faster RAM perhaps ourselves later on should we need to uh, and also if you go between the 16 gigabytes and the 32 gigabytes version you're paying 200 extra for that upgrade it's fairly reasonable that is the price that you would pay in the market for a 32 gigabyte kit but keep in mind that a 16 gigabyte to 32 gigabyte is just a single dim module upgrade so you know, Dell is basically charging you double the price there for a 16 gig module than what you'd pick up at any retailer uh, any computer retailer However, because the base RAM would come in two DDR5 modules, you'd have to swap both out. So hence, you'd be doubling your cost. It's it's a convenience over you know headache versus thing. So I picked the 32 gigabytes out of the box because I don't want to open up this device and commit to doing any upgrades or anything inside it unless I've decided once and for all that this will be my device for the year. Additionally, as I mentioned earlier, the hard drive, I've got with the base 512 gig NVMe drive here because as soon as you try to move forward, the prices jump considerably. So from 512 gigabytes to one terabyte adds another $100 that's fairly acceptable but considering you can get two terabyte S ssds at gen 4 speeds now for around 120 to 150 dollars canadian depending on when what fire sale is running currently you can also opt for a 2 by 512 gigabyte pcie m.2 ssd configuration so that will occupy both of your m.2 slots at 2230 uh, and that will basically give you max out those two slots you can also get some two at two terabyte four terabyte or even crow crazy and go with the eight terabyte option however i would not recommend that for anyone because the price difference between 512 gigs and eight terabytes is several thousand dollars and i'm sure you could do that upgrade yourself for maybe much more or less than that. Also in the LCD section, it doesn't make sense to go with a 480 Hertz FHD display for me in this case, because I'm not doing competitive uh, gaming. If you are a you know CSGO player or Fortnite player and you need those crazy fast frame rates, then this is an option for you. But at eight, only 1080p, it seems like it's very low resolution for a display of this size. I believe the sweet spot is 
Quad HD Plus for many of these large screen laptops for 2023, and I'm glad that Dell has opted with that uh, choice as well. However, this runs only at 165 hertz uh, instead of the 240 hertz. We'll talk about that in just a moment here. And also, as I mentioned, I had upgraded to the Cherry MX Ultra Low Profile Mac keyboard. So is it worth it? I don't know. Am I going to annoy some people in the office? Probably. I hope it's not too bad. Otherwise, I'm going to end up sending this back because it does make quite a bit of noise and it's very clangy. It's the tactile version. They don't have any other offerings in this yet in terms of uh, other types of key switches, perhaps linear or maybe brown switches. So we'll see if there's any option for that. But I'm glad that Dell is giving this option on many, many more of their laptops this year. Last year was very few and very specific configurations, at least in Canada. So thank you, Dell, for giving us some options here to be able to select this on most laptop models for this year that have been uh, available so far for Alienware. And finally, the last and final specification that I've selected for my laptop is, of course, the gaming GPU. So no gaming gaming laptop would be complete without a choice here. So let's break down what your options are for this device and what I've selected. So uh, Dell is giving you a couple of different options here. There's a 4060 base model, which starts at about $2699 Canadian. Uh, but the real stars here, I believe, are the 4080 and 4090. As I've reviewed the 4060 and the 4070 in the Razer Blade 18 and the Rogue Strix G18 for this year, uh, those devices don't seem to exceed uh, 100 watts of performance, sustained performance. So you're really leaving a lot on the table considering that they're promised at 140 watts and they don't even deliver on that promise. Uh, the 4080 and 4090 are supposed to be 175 watts of power and so thus i've selected the 4080 because as we can see here the, there's a considerable jump as is from the 4060 to 4080 that's a 1250 dollars jump uh, and if we also include the jump up to the 4090 it's even more significant leaving almost everything else alone unfortunately what dell does is it binds some of these upgrades to additional changes such as the cpu so whether you like it or not you're getting an i9 with 24 cores if you want the 4090 so i did not opt for the 4090 i would suggest that you also do the same if you have additional options in your region uh, be very careful and really carefully select what kinds of games you play and what kinds of what kind of games you might want to be playing in the next year or two and then look at some benchmarks that relate to how those games perform on a particular class of gpu this is one thing about your laptop that you will not be able to upgrade so make sure you choose the right choice ram ssd all these other elements can be upgraded later so it, it is a little bit daunting to try to figure out what is the right choice in my case i've selected the 4080 here for this laptop and for this review of course, the star of these devices this year are the 18 inch displays, as I've looked at with the Razer Blade 18 and also the Rogue Strix G18. Uh, this Alienware M18 R1 also features an 18 inch Quad HD Plus display. However, there's few differences to point out between this device and the display that I've looked at on the Rogue Strix G18 as well as the Razer Blade 18. So first and foremost, we're looking here at a hardware info panel. So let's look at this page and I'll discuss a few different things here. So first and foremost, this is made by LG instead of BOE. That was the case for the other two devices. Uh, those panels were 240 hertz. This device here operates at 165 hertz. They both have a three millisecond response time, however, and they're both rated for 100% DCI-P3 color coverage. I can assure you that while all of these screens look fantastic this one is notably less clear in comparison if you were to put them side by side versus the 240 hertz 18 inch panels for 2023 the other thing I will say is that the luminance on these is a little bit less. So as you start turning down the brightness from 100% down to 50 and especially below 50, uh, this one loses clarity a little bit quicker than you would with the 18 inch 240 hertz displays found either on the Rogue Strix G18 or either on the Razer Blade 18 for 2023. That said, they are all G-Sync displays, they have dynamic switching, all of these devices support Advanced Optimus, they have those buck switches that we've all been craving for the last few years, so finally we're getting those things in, you know, much of the majority of the gaming laptops uh, coming this year. Uh, other than that, the game experience, however, and the feel as you're actually playing 
the game. There's no lag. There's no screen tear. That G-Sync keeps everything smooth. The colors look absolutely fantastic and they do pop at full 100% brightness. It's not OLED levels of pop, but with an IPS display, I think this is a great option. Considering that these are flagship devices for this year, I'm a little surprised that Dell opted to go for a slower version at 165 Hertz and not stick with the big boys at 240 Hertz. Plus, there is no 240 hertz option that you can opt for in this display. As I've mentioned, you can either do go to QHD plus 2560 by 1600, 16 by 10 aspect ratio, or you can opt for a full HD 480 hertz 18 inch display. So that's all really to be said about the display. They are fantastic displays. We can nitpick, of course, on tiny little things, but this is going to be an amazing experience. And doing some performance testing on the CPU here using ADA64 to do a CPU stress test. I've got the hardware info panel open here. We're also watching in the task manager so we can see what the performance is like on this device. And as we can see here, as soon as the benchmark kicks off, it jumps right up to about 100C for the temperatures on the Intel CPU. And it consumes about 140 plus watts there before settling down to a more reasonable 115 to 120 watts uh, sustained power on this device that is with the cpu undervolted by 50 millivolts in the alienware command center and uh, overclock basically allowing it to run all the way up to 5.4 uh, gigahertz without any limits there and uh, what it's running at is basically it's consuming all of the cpu resources here and you can see that the clock rates hovers everywhere but over after a while as the fan kicks in it settles down to around 80 high 80s in terms of the cpu temperature and it can sustain that for quite a long period of time so you know dell and intel have done a better job at optimizing these things this year the thermal solutions are quite capable as well as the cpus are you know raptor lake is quite efficient this year versus what alder lake was bringing to the table last year don't really have many complaints here let's look next at some of the benchmarks now let's look at some of the PC benchmarks here. So the PC10 benchmark here, you can see that they're within a stone throw of each other. Although it seems like they're trading blows, one seems to step over the other while the other one kind of falls behind. And the Razer Blade, the Rogue Strix G18, and also the Alienware M18 R1 kind of trade blows depending on what uh, benchmark you're looking at. Here in Blender with open data, they're pretty much aligned. It's neck and neck, I would say. The percentages are so small that if you were to calculate the actual differences, it would be single digits perhaps. Uh, then we look at the 7-zip compression rating. So this is the benchmark that's built into the 7-zip tool itself. Uh, and although the ROG Strix looks like it's far behind, if you look at it comparatively, again it's just single digit percentages there so looking at geekbench 6 next this is just a cpu benchmark and we can see here that again they are neck and neck uh, this time with the rogue strix g18 taking the lead build that 13980 hx and the higher 5.6 gigahertz boost clocks uh, and then finally in cinebench for single core what we see here is that there again you know the 13900h with the lowest boost clock at 5.4 gigahertz is far behind then the razor blade 18 at 5.5 and then finally the top of the stack 13980hx at 5.6 gigahertz but when we jump into the multi-core it kind of swaps a bit and we look like you know it looks like that uh, the strix is still at the very top uh, and uh, or excuse me the now the alienware is at the top strix is behind and then the razor blade falls a little bit further behind all right now for the fun part of this video we're looking at some uh, clips here from gameplay footage i've just got one minute highlights here from five different games here we're looking at the witcher and we can see that the rtx 4080 is definitely delivering on those promises so we're seeing about 160 165 watts consistently as we go through the gameplay here it's very very smooth we're hovering close to the triple digits of course i've maxed everything out including uh, dlss ray tracing hair works and everything is cranked as much as possible to the max this is a v4.02 update with all of the latest ray tracing goodies high resolution textures uh, and overall updates to color and everything that has been applied to this game for 2023 and it is really a good test or you know, looking at the RTX 4000 series and what the performance is really like currently with these new GPUs. And I would say that I'm overall pretty impressed. If you tune a little bit further, you can definitely lock this to about uh, triple digit frame rates. But I think that 87, 90 FPS running around playing this game is fantastic. Here we're looking at the benchmark for Borderlands 3. So what I decided to do here is to just use the in canned in-game benchmark. I love these because it's consistent for testing the GPUs. 
and as we can see here we're definitely in the triple digits locked and if we look at the power rating here the gpu is hovering around 170 175 maybe even a few uh, watts over that so thank you to rtx 4080 and alienware for giving us this kind of performance this is impressive indeed and this is what i was looking forward to when i heard about the rtx 40,000 series or excuse me 4000 series uh, however the 4050 4060 and 4070 have been a completely different story so it looks like those are going to be for the thin and lights and all of the 100 waters uh, and under but if you're really looking for the gaming performance here with the rtx 4000 series and the ray tracing support and the dlss support then you really should be looking at the 4080 or perhaps even the 4090 gpus for your next gaming laptop so here we are uh, and then the next game is cyberpunk 2077 this one is quite heavy i almost want to say that we know the dream is alive where we've given up the 60 fps and we move far beyond that but this game and also we'll see here fortnite still kind of push these gpus to their limits again i've got everything here ray tracing set to psycho mode everything else is cranked to ultra uh, and dlss is turned on so with that we're getting about 60 65 70 ish fps uh, it's a little bit unstable here because the the power wattage for the gpu is going between 140 145 160 sometimes up to 170 watts uh, but it is definitely getting closer to that performance level that's been promised unlike what we saw with the 4060 and the 4070 in the blade 18 and the rogue strix g18 uh, for 2023 to 2023 that i've also tested on my channel channel so this is kind of the performance that we should be looking at. Uh, it's very impressive. This would have been last generation's desktop CPU level or GPU level performance. Uh, so here again is another example of bringing these GPUs still to their knees. Uh, so Fortnite here have cranked everything up in terms of the Unreal Engine. So Lumen, uh, all of the lighting, ray tracing, hardware ray tracing, by the way, is enabled. And I've turned ep epic uh, textures and everything else to epic settings wherever possible. Uh, and we can see here that this is fully consuming that 175 watts from that RTX 4080 in this Alienware M18 R1. Uh, and, but our frame rate is not the greatest. We're still kind of hovering in the high to mid 40s. Uh, sometimes, you know, goes a little bit further above the 50 level but uh, it's not a 60 fps lock here but despite that i was able to get a few wins and some kills so overall it's still an enjoyable experience and looking at those wattages you know having tested the one the uh, 4060 and 47 and struggled to figure out what's going on there this is a joy of relief not to say that this is an excuse to the manufacturers whether it's nvidia or these implementers the csis uh, for giving us these gpus you know or telling us that they're capable of 140 watts when they really are not and finally here we're looking at red dead redemption 2 this again is the in-game benchmark so we can see here that this game is also all over the place it's going sometime between 100 watts or even a little bit lower than that but it does hit all the way up to 150 155 or even 160 watts i have seen it it really depends on the scene uh, but we're looking at very close to triple digit frame rates here again this is a five-year-old game and we're looking at the memory on the gpu usage here is about six gigs six and a half gigs it does uh, jump up to almost seven gigs in certain scenarios so that 12 gigs of vram that's included on the rtx 4080 is certainly a big help here uh, if you look at the overall system ra system ram we're exceeding 8 16 gigabytes so hence my i'm doubling down on my uh, you know recommendations this year of at least having 32 gigs of system ram and at least having 8 gigs of video ram for your gpu as for the speakers on this alienware m18 r1 i've got to say there's two speakers in this, inside this device they're okay it sounds loud and decent you can game on speakers you know if you crank the volume all the way up it kind of drowns out the fan noise but they're nothing spectacular to write home about they're certainly not thx tuned speakers that you got from the razor blade 18 for 2023 uh, this one does have dolby support though and if you go in there is a dolby app installed which allows you to configure different sound profiles for movies voices you know gameplay fps types of stuff etc i found that to be quite annoying because it was preventing me and some of my bluetooth headphones from being able to be detected by windows as the default device so when you connect a bluetooth pair of headphones windows switches over to that as a playback and input device and i was just getting connected in the bluetooth control panel and it was not switching over without me having to remove and repair those headphones every time uh, so that was very very irritating i don't know if it's 
that particular pair of headphones, but I've been using them for months with, and I've tested them with all the other laptops that I've used here with the Rogue Strix G18, with the Blade 18 as well. I don't know what that issue is. I, I hate the fact that these softwares basically get in the way and try to take control over the hardware, uh, but it is what it is. I've, you know, did a little bit of initial Googling to try to figure out if I can solve this issue, but thus far I have not found a solution. So yes, speakers are there. They sound okay. They get pretty loud. All right, so I've now been uh, soaking this laptop with some heat. Uh, doing some gameplay in the witcher 3 for a little bit here so we're running at about 170 watts 160 watts 172 watts on this gpu and cpu combination so i've got my overhead cam on here and i've also got my face cam on i've got my laptop in front of me here so let's scan the device around and see what kind of thermal conditions we're in so let's turn on our uh, thermal gun here and we'll start at the top so let's see if we start out here we're looking at around 28 degrees. Now keep in mind that right now I'm in custom mode in the Alienware Command Center. I've got the fans cranked all the way up to 100%. Uh, there is four fans in this device. Uh, there's two large and two smaller fans that help keep this device cool. So as you can see here at the very top near the screen display here where the big metal heat sinks and the vapor chambers are, we're getting definitely into the 50s. So that. 175 watts sure does put out a lot of heat and we can see here that it's you know it's it's visible that we're getting 50 50 degrees 49 degrees all the way across the device let's keep it tilted here a little bit so we can see where our laser laser pointer is and as we go across this entire top section here let me tilt the screen back a little so i can see yep yeah. as we scan across this entire section here we can see that it is in the mid 40s now so if we point around to the sides here and if we look at the sides we're still at mid 40s mid yeah mid 40s approximately so it gets fairly hot uh still in the high 30s it's warm but it's definitely nothing to complain about i mean it's visibly warm but it's also you know i can feel it that there is heat build up there this gpu is staying about 165 watts so if I let me just pull the laptop back here so you guys can see what the power levels are on this GPU as I'm running this game. So here we go. It's running at around 160, 170, 172 watts here in the game actively. And it's putting out a whole lot of heat with that full 175 watts on this GPU. So now let's back it up here a little bit more. We'll take a look at the palm rest here. So this should be fairly nice and cool. Yeah, it's cool to the touch as well. No heat buildup whatsoever. If we look at the trackpad, it should be nice and cool here. No issues around the trackpad. If we go up here to just below the keyboard, it's also very, very nice and cool. It stays cool. No issues with this device. Now, if we go over to the right-hand side here, then it starts to heat up a little because, of course, there's a giant vent all across the right-hand side here all the way basically the full length of the device and similarly here on the left hand side of the device so there is hot air blowing from here all the way out to the end so one point of discomfort is like let's say if i'm using my let me switch hands here if i'm using my mouse here and i'm right-handed there is actively hot air blowing onto my hand and it's actually pretty hot so if we look at the let's see if we can demonstrate it's about 42 degrees the heat the hot air that's blowing out of that vent uh, not pleasant. I mean, it's warm. It's not going to make you sweat. I don't think I played this game here yesterday exactly in this position It also depends you can pull your hand back or you can have it forward I usually have my laptop forward and my hand like right beside it So it's easy to do this gesture keyboard mouse But in everybody varies on how they actually do their hand placement. So anyway, let's head back up here again We'll try to avoid the overlay here. So here we go 37 degrees 39 42 46 degrees 45 so it's in the high 40s a uh, little bit less perhaps on the left hand sides toward the top but if i go all the way up here to the top of the device we're going to be hitting the 50s yeah so in the center here it gets unbearably hot and it's a very similar situation obviously on the bottom because there's this huge chunk of metal which is the vapor chamber all of it serves to soak up heat from the cpu and the gpu and as you can imagine over time it gets very very hot unbearable i mean i can still touch it here it's very hot i wouldn't want to keep my hands here for extended periods of time 
but a few seconds I can feel the heat just soaking into my uh, fingers and into my skin so it is actually quite hot so there you have it I think that's the thermal situation of this laptop the keyboard does get warm particularly in the center area here so if we if we look around these keys it should be in the low 40s yeah there we go 43 44 46 45 so this part of the keyboard gets warm but if you stay towards the WASD keys here you know it's 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 fairly uh it's still warm but it's cooler than where it is in the center and definitely up at the top with the metal of course you're putting nearly 200 watts of heat into this device so what do you expect still if you listen to the fan noise or if you guys can hear the fans it's not actually entirely all that noisy so i'll just uh, pause here for a moment stop talking so you guys can hear the fan noise everything is cranked right now to 100 percent max fans and if we listen to that for a moment In my opinion, one thing that Dell has always done really well in Alienware specifically is that their fan noise is always more of a whooshing sound. There's a, you know, it indicates that the flow, there's a large flow of air, but it's never to the point of where it's annoying, squeaking or high pitched. Some of the older MSI laptops that I've used like the GS66 from a couple of years ago. Oh my God, the, the squeaky fan noise, the high pitched fan noise on those, uh, on that laptop was just unbearable for more than a few minutes at a time. I had to, I had to basically give that up because I couldn't stand it for a while. Combine that with coil wine, and that was just a deal breaker for me. So these fans are running at 100%. They do, you know, manage to keep the device cool here. It is very hot here. Like I said, if I keep my hands here, the heat soaks in. But other than that, it's not going to burn you. It's cooler to the side. You can feel the suction of the airflow here, and then the hot air being exhausted off the sides and across the back. So this entire Tron ring here that you see on the back here. So all of this, there is tremendous amount of heat coming out from back here, uh, not in the center because that's where the ports are, but on this side and on this left hand side here. So there's a lot of air, very, very hot air being exhausted uh, from those fan vents there. Uh, so overall, I would say that the noise is tolerable. If you put this, of course, into a balance mode or a performance mode, you'll be able to get more performance out of or less performance. But the trade-off will be a lot, uh, a lot less fan noise and maybe a little bit uh, better thermal management because it won't push so much wattage to the CP or the GPU. I've got an overclock here running as well. I'll share those settings uh, in the Alienware Command Center overview, and I'll talk about how you can manage your own overclocking and undervolting with this device. Thank you, Dell, for giving us uh, those options. So let's jump in now and look at the Alienware Command Center. I think that's all we want to really look at in terms of the thermals and the fan noise. Okay, so this is a test of the microphones and the webcam that is built into the Dell M. Alienware M18 R1 for 2023 featuring the RTX 4080. This has the Intel uh, sound technology which basically is supposed to give us clearer audio with the built-in microphones that are into this device. And we're looking here at the approximately 2 megapixel pixel webcam that Dell has upgraded from the previous years and the previous generations which were basically 720p potato cams. How does it look? How do you think the colors show off? It seems to have you know, very low detail. I think the, the Razer Megapix 5 megapixel camera was far superior to this. How does it sound? As I'm recording this, I'm registering very, very low decibels, so I'll probably have to boost the audio in post because you probably cannot hear what I'm saying and it's inaudible. So we'll have to do that in the review and you guys can see what the webcam looks like. Let me know in the comments below if you think this is an upgrade or, you know, have we gone sideways here. All right, so in this hopefully short video, I'll give you an overview of the new Alienware Command Center. So Dell has now revamped, or I mean totally revamped from the ground up, the Alienware Command Center software. In past years, I found it to be buggy, slow loading, it would not install, the modules would not update. There were so many issues with the Alienware Command Center that Dell has really does, done a bang up job on coming back to that rebuilding it from the ground up and it is better although there's still a few quirks so let me tell you about them so the first things first is when you open this alienware command center up uh, if you boot up into your windows machine and you launch this immediately you'll get a message stating that hey all of the components have not finished loading so please give it a moment before you can actually jump in and start changing things in the alienware command center so let's open this up it's a little slow still to load but i like the animations here so the alien head kind of wakes up once all of the components have loaded and then it basically 
uh, jumps us right into the Alienware command center. So it's nicely laid out. It's a little bit simple, which is great. So here we are at the screen. If you click this, it just doesn't, uh, it takes you into the uh, Alien FX system because that's the lighting. But if you go back from the home screen here, so let me talk about the different tabs first. So there's the active tab, which is a system. There is the performance tab here, which, you know, where we'll, where we'll do all of the fan tweaking, the fan curves, the different optimization and performance modes, as well as overclocking. I'll give you an overview of that. We have our Alien FX tab, which is where you control different lighting aspects of your Alienware device. So you can select one zone, multiple zones, and you can choose different effects, lighting effects here, presets. Uh, and then you can apply those. You can do custom colors and all kinds of crazy stuff here. The other thing you can do is the keyboard lighting is also contained here. You can, of course, select which keys you want to affect. You can apply lighting effects. You can do custom colors here, all kinds of fancy stuff. There is a game library, and this allows you to go in games specifically and target each game with a specific performance mode if that's what you so choose. So if you have a game that needs maybe a little bit more performance, you can come in here and do that. You can also have an option for Alienware FX. You can define presets that are specific to a game kind of like what razor blade 18 does out of the box you can map your own keys to the hot keys on your keyboard and colorize them so that when you're in the game it's easier for you to identify what keys on the keyboard will do what there's also a device feature here so this will allow you to apply keyboard presets as well so lighting and keyboard presets and you can do that here and then from here you can directly launch which will basically open up the associated launcher it's epic launcher steam whatever and then it will launch the game for you it's a nice handy shortcut seems to work pretty well so the other thing here is this is dolby atmos dolby atmos is the uh, sound control panel for sorry the sound tech that is supported in the 2023 alienware m18 r1 and it uses this dolby access software to control and you know apply all the presets here so if we take a look at settings very quickly you can disable all these specs i've done that because i was having so many issues with my bluetooth headphones connecting and being identified by a window as a proper playback and an input device it also supports Dolby Vision for the display here. You can choose different few different modes and it basically kind of just, you know, dims or, or changes the, the contrast and the brightness levels on the display to give you the particular look that you're after. If we enable this, what you'll get here is there's a few different options, basically just like modes on as if you would on a sound bar or a sound system. You can tune this for a particular type of game, racing, RTS. Uh, you can turn on performance mode, use some type of uh, preset EQs to apply to the type of sound you're after. There's also a dynamic mode, which kind of lets it, you know, adjust stuff on the fly. Movie mode, if you're watching movies, music, voice, and then in custom mode, you can go here and play with all of these EQs and really tune to your heart's content. If you go into more settings here, you can choose some stuff that will configure advanced controls about uh, this device. But if you go here to product, so this will allow you to select, you know, with one hand or excuse me, one click, whether you're playing through the speakers, you're on headphones now, uh, you want to have some sort of a home theater setup, or you want to just turn on display vision for the device. So it kind of lets you toggle between them. Seems to work pretty well. This is just for theming. I don't know what is the purpose of that, but it is what it is. So let's go back here to the performance tab first. I think that's where you'll do most of your hanging out here. That's where all of the interesting stuff is. Out of the box, it comes with four or rather five modes. So there's the battery mode, which puts it into express charge. This can also be controlled from the Dell Power Manager as I've mentioned elsewhere. It puts it into quiet mode, which gives you basically you know, silent operation. Fans are almost turned off or inaudible and you get a lower performance. Balance is the pro profile that it's on when you get it and take it out of the box. This kind of does a balance between the two, switches over to Optimus when you're gaming or doing something that's 3D intensive. Otherwise, for all intents and purposes, it's running against the iGPU inside the Intel i9. And performance will tune it to a higher level. And finally, the last one here is overdrive. This one will basically max out the fans and max out all the performance, basically push all the wattages and everything into each component, the CPU and the GPU. And then we have a custom preset here, which is what I've been using to try to, uh, you know, tweak and see how much power I can get out of this device. This little display here, it's a very nice little toggle. So if you toggle between these two, you'll see the fan speeds and the temps. If you toggle back to performance, you'll see the utilization of your CPU, GPU, your RAM, as well as your hard drive space. 
There's some other facts and figures here about the frequency of your CPU, the temperature it's running at. So it's a nice little monitoring hub without having to need our pop up and hardware info necessarily. Thank you for that, Dell. This is actually nicely laid out. It's visually appealing. I like it very much. So one thing you can do here is if you just switch these modes, it'll give you lots of warnings about things that'll get affected, etc., etc. Um, the overdrive mode specifically, if I can give it a second here to toggle, it is a little. The fans are immediately starting to ramp up. And if we go over to the terminal here, we can see that these fans are now spinning CPUs up to 90%. CPU, the, zone, the second fan for the CPU zone is going up to 80% and the GPU is hitting 100%. So that's our performance mode. It's really meant for gaming. Uh, overdrives pretty much does the same thing, except it'll push all of these guys even higher. So here we go, 81, 90, and it's going up to 100%. <laughs> A little slow, but they do ramp up. And it gets quite loud here but again it's nothing it's not high pitched there's no screaming it, it's not very annoying and then custom is the mode that i like to use this is where you go if you want to overclock your gpu or your cpu so let me show you that view once you pop into that you have two different levels of control here you have the zone itself and then you have the advanced view so the advanced view is where you would do your overclocking so if you wanted to crank these fans up to 100% manually, you could go over to offset, crank it to 100, hit save, and this will max out that particular fan. There's four of them, so you have to repeat this step. For each of these, as you can see, I've already offset this here. Same with this one and with this one as well. So if we go back to, you have to toggle back to the GPU zone to get back to this toggle between performance and thermal. Now if we go over to performance, again, each of these will have advanced views. You cannot overclock the system RAM or the hard drive. Doesn't make sense. So here we go. If we go to the CPU tab, you have some adjustments here. You can choose where you want the frequency of the CPU to live. You can also set it to auto manage and it'll figure out what the voltages are, etc. But I like to tune it to manual and leave it somewhere around the middle here, 1.325 volts. And for this, I like to crank it all the way down to basically undervolt the CPU. Thus, we'll get a little bit better thermal performance. When you do that in this uh, custom mode though, it will do a test to make sure your system is stable so you don't end up freezing your system or locking your system and having to have a, do a hard reboot. So I like this feature. Thank you very much for doing that. It's a very brief test. I don't know what they're utilizing underneath to do this, but it seems to work pretty well. And I have not thus far uh, crashed my machine or ended up in a situation where I was not able to use the laptop. So I've played around with this quite a bit. It works well. Thank you very much for that, Dell. Again, it's nice to see the CPU temp here and the frequencies while we're doing that. So here we go. We've now basically undervolted our CPU. Now let's look at the GPU. If we go over here, we can adjust the power limit, some temperature settings. I like to leave this right around 80. Uh, and then if we look at the clock here, I have uh, tried to overclock this by 100 megahertz and the memory clock by 300 megahertz. Let's see if this will hold steady. I've tried this, you know, 20, 10, 10 and 20 megahertz at a time to really get it to a stable place, test with a few games. It's very time consuming to do. And I'm not really even sure how much performance we get out of this, maybe two, 3% max. So <laughs> I would almost say that it's not worth the time, but really if you're, if you're not tweaking these machines that are multi thousand dollars, then you're leaving performance on the table and we cannot have that. Can we? Here we go. Full GPU utilization successful. Okay. So we've got a hundred megahertz overclock on the GPU core clock and GPU memory clock is overclocked by 300 megahertz. And that's it. That's our overclocking. It's set now. And you can see the fans are still whirring in the background. It'll basically give you the most performance at this. So I've used this and now I can run benchmarks and, and do what I need to do. If you go into the alien FX tab, let's go back here for a moment. Let me put this back into silent mode. So it's not unnecessarily creating noise for us here. Come on. Over on the Alien FX tab, you have basically two different things that you can control. One is your device. So this includes all zones, or you can individually select the alien head, which is on the back of the lid here. And you can choose these two zones, which are basically for the stadium lighting. So one on top and one on the bottom, and you can individually apply a preset here. So you can do color, for example, on this one, and this one here, you could set it to pulse, and you'll get some pretty cool lighting effects uh, controlled from your Alienware command center here. 
on your device itself you have also the power button you can control that from here so you can set it to different uh, you can set it to different colors but basically the functions are if it's fully charged it's a solid light if it's charging it's a little bit dimmer and if it's blinking you're in sleep mode then if you look at the other tab here, this is the configuration for the Cherry MX keyboard. So here you can go in and individually pick to your heart's content and basically configure all the keys that you want. You know, choose presets if you want to just do a selection. For example, if I want to take these number keys and change it to a preset. Hey, come on. Uh, here we go, yellow. I hit save and then immediately applies that to my keyboard. So play around with this. You can also bind keys here if you want to do that. Uh, this I've already shown off the library. You can go in and configure game specific modes to run as well as alien FX and keyboard specific presets that you want to load up. And that's basically about it for Alienware's uh, command center. So they have done a bang up job. I like it. It's simple. It's easy. It gives us what we really need at our fingertips, which is overclocking, undervolting, fan curve control, uh, and the CPU, GPU monitoring all in one place. So thank you for that, Dell. Too many modes here, though. I don't have time to test every single mode. I like to run it custom and basically tweak to my heart's content. So hopefully you'll have a lot of fun with that. Uh, and it'll give you the control you need over this device. All right, now to say a few words about the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth solution on this device. So this is running an Intel Wi-Fi solution. Uh, Intel has now purchased Killer, so it's actually a Intel Killer solution, but it's still based on the Intel Wi-Fi modules. So this device comes with an Intel Killer AX1675i in my solution here, uh, which claims up to 2.4 gigabits per second speeds. It is a tri-band adapter, so you get 2.4, 5, and 6 gigahertz operation on this device and it supports all the way up to Wi-Fi 6E which is 802.11ax and it includes Bluetooth 5.3. I believe that also comes with Bluetooth LE support so that means better uh, battery life for de devices that are connected over Bluetooth such as wireless headphones. 5.3 is the latest standard so it's really nice to have that. Thank you very much Dell. And if we go over to the Intel specifications page here, let's look at what they have to say about this device. So this was released in quarter four of 2020. So it's it's not a young device by any means. And if we look here, it's got you no know, pretty broad support. The Intel Wi-Fi devices seem to have done really, really well for Linux and other operating system support as well. So thank you very much for that, Intel. Uh, and we can see here that it's a two by two. It's a BIMO device. So yes, multi multi. I forget what this is called, multi-uplink, MIMO, multi-user MIMO, yeah, so multi-in, multi-out. Uh, so it's got that technology and it's based, uh, it's on the motherboard itself. This is a removable Wi-Fi card. You can actually take the cover off of the bottom of the device. You can unscrew it. It's an M.2 style 2230 and you can take out the Wi-Fi adapter and replace it with a new one. It says here. It says here in the specifications that this is an M.2 2230 uh, standard device uh, in terms of packaging and, and sizing. So that's all really there is to say about that. One gripe I do have about the Bluetooth connectivity has been fantastic. No issues connecting. However, as I mentioned earlier, because this comes with the Dolby Access software uh, for the Dolby Atmos, solution that is inside this device in terms of the audio dolby access seems to be blocking some of my wireless headphones bluetooth headphones from actually connecting to windows and then windows switching over to them as the playback device i've gone into the dolby access software but haven't been able to find a solution or a way to specifically select my headphones uh, bluetooth headphones for windows to use them the only solution i found thus far is to remove the paired headphones repair the headphones when i'm in windows and that seems to work it is very very annoying and irritating i resorted to using wireless headphones a few times as a result but i would really love to get this solution uh, for this problem if i find something i will pin a comment uh, talking about what the solution was so that's all really there is to say about the uh, the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth here, it works very well. The Bluetooth, the Wi-Fi gets about 20 megabytes per second speeds and higher. I've seen it go up to 25, 28 megabytes per second. Nothing to complain about there. Signal strength is okay. If you are extremely on the opposite end, for example, if the, if the Wi-Fi router is in the basement in this corner of the house and you go up multiple levels up to this corner of the house on this side, then you know if you're diagonally across from it, you may have some signal strength drop. But otherwise, I was able to maintain connectivity and it was it was slower for sure, but maybe around eight or nine megabytes per second. But you know, that is the reality of Wi-Fi today. 
Having looked at all of the different aspects of this device, I wanted to give you my opinion on the price and value proposition of this device and whom this device is really meant for. So if you look here at the Dell Alienware page, let's look at how I've got my device configured and then I'll talk about what I think the, the value of this device really is. So I have to choose the 4080 because that's what I'm running in this device. As soon as I do that, it switches from the 13700HX over to the 13900HX CPU. The other change I've made is from 16 gigabytes to 32 gigabytes of RAM and I've left the hard drive as is. The only other upgrade I've done is the Alienware Cherry MX Ultra Low Profile Keyboard and I've left the 18 inch 165 hertz screen uh, as my choice. So when I do that, I have end up basically at 4,100 Canadian dollars. Once you add taxes, it becomes around $4,300 to maybe more depending on which area of Canada you live in. So that said, this is a very, very expensive machine. Uh, and if you look at the value proposition, in my opinion, because I also own uh, multiple desktops, uh, multiple laptops, you know, thin and lights, ultrabooks, a business level laptop such as the Dell Latitude series. I've owned many of those over the past, ThinkPads. And for my gaming purposes, I have a Nintendo Switch and a PS5. I'm not really sure that the value proposition is there for this laptop to be just simply a gaming laptop for me. But since, or for you, excuse me. But since I'm going to be using this device for video editing, for content creation as my mobile workstation device, I think the value proposition is definitely there for me. You'll have to look at it and evaluate based on what is your workflow and what is your scenario for buying such a device like this. Of course, if you're, if you're buying it for gaming and you want the best of the best, if you pop over to that 4090, you're now looking at nearly $4,650. And that means once you add in taxes, you're looking at a $5,000 laptop for gaming. If if this is going to be your one and only device, your one and only desktop slash laptop slash computing device that is for your work, for your research, for media consumption, for gaming, the value proposition increases because it's your one and only device. And based on the fact that there is there is multitudes of other options if you're just after gaming, for example, an Xbox or a PS5 will get you many of the same game library uh, games that you can play on your PC. There will still always be a few exclusives, but then again, that goes for any platform. There's PS5 exclusives that you cannot play on the PC. Uh, so you have to kind of take your pick there. I do like the upgradability of this device as well. I can add more RAM if I need to in the future, all the way up to 64 gigs. I hope Dell provides a, a BIOS update in the future to support 5600 megahertz and faster RAM perhaps. That would be a really big help. And with those four SSD slots, I can really max out the storage on this thing up to nine terabytes. That is phenomenal. And the i9-13900HX with 24 cores and 32 threads is no slouch. That display is beautiful. Better life could be better, but hey, you can't have everything and eat it too. So uh, anyway, that is my conclusion on the price and value proposition. Let's wrap this review up with my final thoughts. All right, the Dell Alienware M18 R1 for 2023 with the RTX 4080 has so much going for it. That RTX 4080 at 175 watts really delivers performance uh, as promised. The thermals are under check. The fan noise is not bad at all. If we look at the actual Cherry MX keyboard on this device, it's a fantastic nice touch to have for those keyboard junkies. It is absolutely a pleasure to use that device. The screen is gorgeous at 18 inches quad HD plus at 165 hertz and three milliseconds response time. Nothing to complain about there. It gets fairly bright. It has Dolby Vision support. The sound is okay considering it only has two speakers, but it's tuned by Dolby Atmos. The two bad things I can say about this device, one is that the power adapter is a brick and I mean a literal brick, not figuratively speaking here. And this device weighs a ton and not a metric ton, you know, a, a ton figuratively speaking because it weighs nine pounds. And in 2023, I don't think there's any other laptop on the market that weighs quite as much as this one does here. So I don't know why Dell needed all that extra weight considering most of the other 18 inches on the market are sitting right around seven pounds. It is also wider and deeper than most 18 inch devices. So it will definitely not fit in a 17 inch laptop bag. You'll need to purchase a separate bag 
pack. And if you add the power adapter as a, your daily carry with this device, you're looking at well over 10, 10 and a half, maybe closer to 11 pounds on your daily carry. I would not suggest that that is something you carry around with you every day in your backpack to work, college, office, wherever. The price is actually also quite steep. You are definitely paying the early adopters tax here and you're paying for the latest and greatest goods right up front when they launch. If you were to wait a few months, I'm sure things will be heavily discounted here. The state of the world is that we're heading into a global recession. I am not sure if these types of prices can be sustained on these devices. Everybody, of course, is trying to milk the consumer for as much as they can. That includes Nvidia, AMD, Intel, all of them. I am not playing favorites here and neither should you. You should speak with your wallet, fight the tyranny that's basically going on as the price tyranny that's being, you know, imposed on us by saying yes, buy higher and higher and higher tier prices. Why can we not have the 4070 with an excellent mid tier GPU? Why does it have to be so close to the 4060 and 4050 so that we can be pushed upwards and forced to expend the extra money to buy the 4080 or even perhaps the 4090? That said, the 4080 is still relatively speaking between 20 to 25, perhaps 30% in certain titles above what the 3080 could do from last generation. Uh, if you go to the 4090, it's about 40 to 50%. It's a significant jump. And even the delta between the 4080 and the 4090 is definitely noticeable. On to the next one. So thanks very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this review. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them in the comments below. Thank you very much. See you in the next one.